We're now going to have the perspective from the European Union. Um, I can think of few other that would be better positioned to help um, deliver that perspective uh, than our good friend Lucas Visek, who, of course, is a member of Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans. Cabernet, Lucas, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Mark, and good uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I can't think of... Um, of a better quote to start uh, on the day which is the UN World Soul Day and being in, a, in, a, in an event on the transatlantic dialogue than to quote Mark Twain who said, uh, by land, they're not making it anymore. Um, the problem uh, that we have in the European Union and I believe in other parts of the world, uh, and I would like to, not to uh, paraphrase Mark Twain, I wouldn't dare to, but to add to that is that we also have to take a good care of the land that we have. In the EU, in fact, 60 to 70% of land is in poor condition. It is in unhealthy uh, condition. And that is something that we need to fix. Um, this is why the European Commission put forward uh, um, the EU soil strategy uh, last year. And this is why the Commission is going to put forward the first ever soil health law. We have, uh, uh, we have a, a pretty solid regulatory approach uh, for, uh, for all the other natural resources, for biodiversity, as proposed earlier this year, uh, for air, that's a long-standing one, and the Commission has just proposed its revision. Also, we have long-standing uh, regulatory framework for, for water, but soil as probably the biggest asset that is that farmers actually have at their disposal, which is what farmers work with every single day, is, uh, is not an asset that is, be, that is being protected uh, and that uh, has sufficient level of, of attention. So this is why we have committed ourselves to make all soils, all soils in the EU healthy uh, by 2050. And there are different ways how to, um, uh, how, how to get there. So the very first one that I would like to mention is the regulatory uh, way. Um, this is the soil health law that is coming in spring next, uh, next year. And it is coming with a number of, um, uh, with a number of enabling uh, elements, if you like. Because I think, um, and this is where I fully agree with, uh, with, with uh, Under Secretary, uh, you know, the regulation is a, only a part of the answer. But of course, we need to create a very good, solid, and a very rewarding enabling um, environment. So what are we going to do in the context of the soil health law, but also in addition, or how, how do we create this, this enabling uh, environment and how, what elements are we, going to, are we going to put forward? Well, let me start with something that is actually not part of the proposal, uh, something that is already running quite well, and that is our soil mission. Uh, in fact, in uh, 2021 20, to 2023 20, periods, we're investing about 300 million euros from Horizon Europe uh, to uh, uh, research and innovation activities to promote soil-friendly practices and soil restoration um, in, in agriculture. But that's research. Now, we need to get this somehow to farmers. Uh, we need to, you know, research itself is not going to get, uh, is not going to, get to the field. Uh, what we need to do is, of course, activate our common agricultural policy. It has a massive budget of 387 billion euros over a seven period, uh, over a seven year period of time. It also involves around 11 million farmers uh, in the European Union. So it should, really, it should really count for something. One of the enabling elements clearly is eco schemes. This is an instrument which is available uh, to all farmers, to all beneficiaries of the common agricultural policy. And we are putting at least 46 billion euros in favor, of, uh, in favor of eco schemes. And the good news is that farmers can actually uh, stack them up. So the more they do, the more public goods they deliver, the better care they take of their soil and of the natural environment, the more reward they are actually, uh, they, are going to, they are going to get. But it is not just about public, uh, it's not just about public funding. Uh, we also need to create new business models because, uh, you know, public funding may just not be enough, although, as I said, 387 billion euros should count for something. Uh, last week, the Commission ap adopted its proposal for carbon removal certification. Um, I think this is something that was mentioned in the, uh, 
in the in the headline of this of this session. So I'd like to spend uh, one or two minutes telling you a little bit more about this. We clearly have a commitment in the European Union, which is shared by many countries around the world, to climate neutrality. We want to achieve this by 2050. But we also know that simply by reducing emissions, we will not get to net zero. Uh, we'll be able to, our impact assessments show that we will be able to reduce emissions by about 85 to 95 percent. But then for the rest, we need to remove millions of tons of carbon from the atmosphere and we need to store it. And this is what our proposal uh, is, is all about. We need to incentivize this and we need to create a very solid and robust framework so that we know that when uh, someone tells us that he or she has removed one ton of carbon from the atmosphere and stored it, it is actually being done and the, and the carbon is uh, is still there. Uh, so that's, that's our proposal, and it also creates a completely new business model uh, for farmers, which is not just good for their incomes, because they can be rewarded, they should be rewarded, and they will be rewarded for this, but it also creates a new business model for working with uh, biodiversity benefits, because a lot of these methodology, a lot of these carbon removal activities, uh, such as rewetting of wetlands and peatland, uh, such as agroforestry, actually do provide pretty significant, uh, pretty significant benefits for, for biodiversity. So, you know, going back to what's been said about trade-offs, I think that we really need to get into the paradigm of, uh, of, of delivering on more than one objective, uh, um, which in this case is climate, uh, which is also biodiversity, and which is also uh, farmers', farmers incomes. What we also need to do is that we need to boost investments. Uh, again, 387 billion, 87 billion euros in, uh, in the common agricultural policy should get us uh, pretty far. The question is, what do these, invest what do these investments are used for? Uh, now, we strongly believe that at this time and age, with the illegal Russian war, uh, a very good way of investing is in precision agriculture. It saves costs, it saves inputs, uh, and it ultimately makes farmers, well, richer because they have, uh, because they have lower costs. And of course, uh, these investments support, uh, support food security. This is why we have put, uh, well, we have been putting a bit of pressure on member states to actually incorporate precision agriculture and also to incorporate uh, good farming practices in, uh, in, uh, when, they don't, when they roll out uh, their uh, cup strategic plans starting on 1st of January 2023. Let me end on one point which I think is absolutely, uh, is absolutely essential, and that is that this transition cannot be just about farmers. It cannot be just about what we regulate uh, in agriculture or how we incentivize farmers to produce one way or the other. Our point, the point of the farm to fork strategy, is to make sure that the transition takes place in all parts of the chain. We can motivate our farmers as much as we can, but as long as we waste 20% of food in the European Union, we're not going to we're not going to have a sustainable food chain. 20% for your, for your illustration is about 88 million uh, tons of food. Um, that is what, about half the amount that we export annually. So it's not a very, very small amount. And that's something that we absolutely, that we absolutely need to fix. We also need to look into innovative ways how to, how to get um, how to get you know, better practices into, uh, into private contracts, how to stimulate that. And the good news is that I think a lot of companies have actually woken up and smelled the coffee and are doing this. Uh, they are rewarding farmers for following protocols which involve agroecology, which involve regenerative agriculture, which reward better outcomes for biodiversity uh, and, of course, uh, for climate. After all, the commitment to climate neutrality is there, and it is a commitment. Uh, it is a commitment for all of us. So, if there is one thing, is there's one message that I'd like to uh, leave 
with you. It's precisely this. If we have embarked, when we have embarked on this transition, it needs to really happen along the entire food chain. Everyone has a role to play. Thank you very much. Lucas, um, thank you very much indeed for that. Again, if I may, two quick follow-up questions. Um, like the United States, the European Union is doing a lot of this, the Commission in particular. Any insights, initial insights you can share in terms of how you think farmers and landowners here are reacting, particularly to last week's announcement on carbon removals? And then the same question that I put to Under Secretary Bonney, where do you think the biggest opportunity might be for collaboration between the US and the EU in this area? Well, let me start with the second, with the second question first. Uh, I think that the biggest opportunity is to work on the, on, the, on the objectives that we all share, which is our commitment to the Paris Agreement. Uh, um, there is, yeah, there's so many countries around the world who have committed themselves to climate neutrality. Different countries have different roadmaps, uh, different speeds, different levels of commitments, but ultimately this goal is shared by everyone who has signed the, the, the Paris Agreement. That's the first point, and I think that really there is a lot of scope to, to, to work together um, and, um, and, and, deliver, and deliver on this. Second point um, where I think uh, there is a lot of scope for cooperation is in the fact that uh, in the private sector, um, the private sector, which often you know, is represented by, by multinational global companies, need to make these changes uh, along their entire chain, uh, whether they work with farmers in Europe, uh, in uh, South America, in Africa, or in Asia, or in North America, wherever. Uh, I think a very good example of all of this is our proposal for deforestation, uh, which is now coming to uh, hopefully a very successful end uh, um, in, 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 these, in these days. So I think that this is where, uh, this is where I see the scope, and of course, you know, I cannot omit uh, the whole knowledge exchange. Um, we, uh, the EU um, and the United States, are part of several coalitions that, have, that were born in the UN Food Systems Summit, uh, and I think there is a lot of scope for cooperation, uh, for cooperation uh, there. Now, when it comes to the, when it comes to the reaction in, in our farming community, I think that you know, what, uh, what's, been, what's, been happening, uh, what's been happening quite a lot is that uh, sometimes uh, when you speak with farmers in the European Union, a lot of them have done the right thing. They have, they have, they have taken this step, this giant leap forward, uh, and they've done, they've done the transition. Um, and I worry a little bit that, you know, that their voice is not heard sufficiently in the discussion in the public domain. And what is being heard much more is the voice of people who have not done this for uh, deliberate reasons, because there is a vested interest. Uh, and I think that what would really help is if the voice of those who have done this is heard a little bit more. And I think that you know, it's not just a political point, it's a very, very practical point. Uh, and the practical side of it is that you know, farmers, will, farmers will believe it when they see it. They will believe it when they see that their neighbor has done it. They will believe it when they see that their neighbor has done changes, uh, entered this process with a certain income and came out on the other, on the other end with at least the same amount of money or ideally much better off. It is not just an investment in nature protection. I mean, you know, nature has its ways to protect itself uh, from us uh, and by itself. It's been here for, it's been here 22,500 times longer than us. So I'm sure that, you know, it has its ways. But, so it's not just about doing the right thing for nature, it is really doing, uh, it's about doing the right thing for protecting its own assets, it's about protecting um, uh, uh, soil, uh, since we are on the UN World Soil Day. Lucas Visek, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.